Hello again everyone. In this video we're going to take a look at two files that are essential for Oracle to function properly. Whether you're talking about files that live on the host where the Oracle database lives or if they live on the client which is where you're going to access uh, the Oracle database from. Those two files are called tnsnames.ora and listener.ora. Now the listener.ora is a file that only exists on the server and that's going to configure the listener and tell the listener how to uh, listen for requests for people uh, coming in from the client. And the client could be running anything. The client could be running a web browser application, could be running a forms application, any type of application that needs to communicate to the Oracle database is going to go through the listener. So the listener.ora is going to leave is going to live just on the server. But tnsnames.ora is going to exist both on the server and on any client machine that needs access um, to the Oracle database. So let's start with the tnsnames.ora file. Uh, in your uh, Oracle home, wherever that is, on your machine, if you're running a client machine with, let's say, Oracle Forms on it, uh, you'll have an Oracle home directory. If you're talking about the server with a um, that's running the Oracle database software, um, there'll obviously be an Oracle home for the Oracle server software. Uh, in this example, I'm going to go to my Oracle home, which in, in this case is C Oracle db product 1120 db home 1. So that's my Oracle home for my Oracle database that's running on my server. In your Oracle home you will always have a directory called network and underneath that network directory you will have a directory called admin. And in that admin directory you'll have a couple of different files out there. You can see that I have one called listener.ora another one called tnsnames.ora. This video is going to focus on those two. In a different video we're going to talk about sqlnet.ora. But if we take a look at the tnsnames.ora, let's edit this guy, looks like it's a little hard to read but what this really does is it encapsulates all of the different ways that you can talk to an Oracle database and it puts all of that different information in a specific entry. So if we ignore this Oracle connection data one that's up here, you can see there's three entries in this file. There's Oracle uh, connection data, sandbox, and VIS. So sandbox is going to be the name of my entry. And I can call this anything I want. Just because my database happens to be called sandbox doesn't mean the entry in the TNS names has to be called sandbox. It could be called prod or dev or XYZ or anything that I want. Normally you create uh, an entry with the same name as the actual database name itself. So what are the things that are encapsulated inside this sandbox entry? Well, we have things like the protocol, how we're going to communicate to the database. 99% of shops out there today use TCP IP as your network protocol. Uh, there's backwards compatibility for older network protocol methods, but 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to use TCP IP as your network protocol. What else do I have to specify? Well, I have to specify the host of where this database lives. So my sandbox database is running locally on my machine, oscii1.fourthmonth.com. You can see I have another entry for the VIS database, and that's on a completely different host. And because I'm not running a DNS server inside my local home network here, I have to specify the IP address. The port that the listener for that database is listening on, 1521, is the standard port and the actual service name or the instance name that I'm going to connect to, right? In this case it's called Sandbox. Like I said, the instance name does not have to correspond to the name of the entry that you put in this file. You can call it XYZ or anything you want, but obviously it makes sense to do those types of things. So when it comes time for you to add a new entry to the TNS names aura file, you can certainly go in there and modify it yourself. I mean a real common thing to do would be just to copy an existing entry copy that guy, paste it in here, and then make the necessary changes for uh, the new information that you want to add to the file. But Oracle provides you with a graphical tool also. So um, if you're running on Windows, if you go into your Oracle Home and under uh, Configuration and Migration Tools, there's a tool called a Net Configuration Assistant. I'm going to bring that up right now. 
And it's a wizard. It's a wizard that will go through and it'll ask you a whole bunch of questions about the new things that you want to configure, or if you want to maybe remove entries from your TNS names file. And it will update that information for you automatically. And it's a real nice tool because, as you can see, what the TNS names file looks like, you have all of these open parentheses, close parentheses, you know, all it takes is one um, mistyped character somewhere and it can screw up your whole networking environment. So I'm going to minimize him. And as you can see, the Net Configuration Assistant allows me to configure a whole bunch of different tools. I can configure the listener, named methods configuration, my local net service name, that's the one we're going to do for this. And if we were using Oracle directories, we can configure that through this tool also. But I'm going to uh, do my local net service name configuration. I click on Next. And I can obviously add a new entry, reconfigure an existing entry, delete an entry, rename an entry, do a test. So if I do something like uh, test, I'll get a drop down box, and you can see that the three entries here correspond with the three entries in my TNS names at Aura. Oracle connection data, which is a, 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 speci a specific type of entry for inter process communication. You don't have to worry about that one. Um, or I can modify sandbox or my VIS entry. Those are the three entries that I have there as part of the net service name. So let's just go back and say, you know what, I want to add one. And I'm just going to add this bogus entry that doesn't really mean anything. The service name is going to correspond to the actual instance name of what you want to connect to. So in this case, it's either you know something like Sandbox or VIS. This is where the service name entry is going to go. So I'm just going to create a bogus one called XYZ. What protocol do I want to use? That obviously corresponds with this part right here what protocol I'm going to use to connect to this particular database. And again, most of the time, you're going to use TCP IP. What's the host name? Again, I'm going to give it just a silly name like ABC. That's going to correspond, obviously, to this guy right here, the host. What port do I want to use for my listener? Use the standard of 1521 or some other port. That's obviously going to correspond to this guy right here. Nah, I'm not going to perform a test. And then the net service name is what I'm going to have the entry as here. So even though it's an XYZ database, this might be my dev database. So I'm going to call it dev. Do I want to configure another service name? Nope. Service name complete. Say finish. And then if I reload this file, I'll close this guy out and then just reload him back again. You can see now I have my dev entry that points to the XYZ service, 1521, the ABC host using the TCP IP protocol. It made all the entries in there for me automatically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that guy again. And I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to get rid of that entry because that's going to screw up my TNS names file. But you can see how easy it is to, to use the wizard to go through and create new entries. Like I said, you don't have to use the wizard if you don't want to. You can certainly modify those fields from scratch, modify that file from scratch. But again, you miss one parentheses, one mistyped character somewhere, and the whole thing can go haywire. So let's go back into local. I'm going to delete. Which entry am I going to delete? There's the dev entry. I'm going to delete that guy. Sure you want to delete that? Yep. Boom, he's gone. Boom, he's gone. I'm back to the main page now. Let me close out my tnsnames.aura. Let me re-edit him again. And you can see that the dev entry pointing to that bogus uh, XYZ database is gone. The listener only exists on the server that's running the Oracle database. You don't have to have a listener file running on a client that's going to connect to the Oracle database. Let's take a look at that guy. Kind of similar as to uh, you know, the way the entries are is a lot of descriptions and addresses and, you know, different parentheses all over the place. But here's an example of uh, the listener. And we can give the listener a different name. The default name for the listener is listener. So if I were to go to the command line and I would say LSNRCTL, which is the listener control program, and I just type start, it would automatically default to look for a listener called listener and try to start that listener up. If I had different listener names like XYZ or ABC, I would have to say start ABC or start XYZ or something like that. But if we take the default name, it'll just go to listener. So here's all the information about uh, the listener process, uh, where the Oracle home is, any type of environment variables that it needs, and then here's the actual listener name. So this listener uh, description here corresponds to this guy right here that goes along with the listener. 
and this is just going to display some information about okay how am I going to communicate how am I going to uh, start up my information I'm using the TCP IP protocol here's my host information here's the port information of what I'm going to start up on so if I go into my program here to configure the listener I'm going to pre be presented with the same types of questions right so let's go into the wizard here so what do I want to do? Do I want to add a new listener? Do I want to reconfigure an existing listener? So let's reconfigure an existing listener. And it'll say to me, well, which one do you want to do? Well, the only one that's in there is the default one, the one called listener. So that's the only one I have the ability to do. Listener's currently running. Are you sure you want to stop and modify the listener with the name listener? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So what protocols am I going to use? I can obviously support multiple protocols here. So. I can do that if I want to. Do I want to use a different port number? Now nah, stick with 1521. What TCPIP SSL port number? Because I use TCPIPS as uh, one of the protocols that I'm going to support. So it's going to say, okay, which one do you want to use for that? 2484. Sounds good. Want to reconfigure another listener? Nah. So this is what my listener entry looked like before. I'm going to close out of that guy. Listener configuration complete. I'm going to edit listener again. You can see now it's made another entry for me for TCPS, SSL secure, TCP IP with a different port number. So again, you don't have to use the wizard to configure these different files if you don't want to, but it sure makes things a heck of a lot easier just to make sure that all of the syntax is correct and everything else is set up properly inside your files. Um, the listener, again, only exists on the actual host. That's going to configure the program to listen for requests to the Oracle database. TNS names exist both on the host, where the Oracle database is running, and on your different client machines. Now, if you access Oracle via a web browser and a program on a web browser, the TNS names file, where is that going to exist? Well, it's going to exist where the web browser is the, that's serving up the application server because that's where the actual program lives. It's just serving up information to you on a web browser. So in that case, you may not have a TNS names.org file running locally on your client machine if you're accessing it through a true web-based application. The web-based application, wherever that server is that's serving up the web pages, that's the thing that ha is actually going to connect to your Oracle database. So there has to be a TNS names.org file somewhere there on that server unless it's using a protocol like JDBC, Java Database Java Database Connectivity, which doesn't use a TNS names out or a file. It's programmatic inside the actual Java program to say this is how I'm going to connect to an Oracle database. But if you're using a tool like Oracle Forms or some other tool that runs locally on your machine that talks to an Oracle database, you're going to have to have that TNS names file locally on your machine also.